we're very lucky in that the kind of data we work with at Bitly is relatively small. And I have colleagues who are astrophysicists, people working with large amounts of sensor data, where they're at the point where they actually have to engineer data systems just to collect and then throw away um, most of their data. Um, I've heard a, a story from someone who, um, and I don't remember which telescope they worked at, but essentially uh, they're working at a huge telescope. It took an hour to realign it to a new direction, and in that hour, they would have to run an algorithm to decide which pieces of the data from the last hour they could keep or throw away. And if they happen to make the wrong decision, they could lose. It takes years to get time on this telescope. They could lose years of work, um, which is much higher stakes than animated GIFs and pictures of kittens on the internet. <laughs> um, but we've also benefited from that in a huge way by uh, other people building technologies to solve this problem. So from the very beginning, we copied every bit of Bitly data into Amazon's cloud. And when Amazon years later came out with uh, you know, simple search services and Elastic MapReduce over their cloud storage, we were able to just turn that on. Uh, and so I wonder if there are either open source collaborations or other people with similar adjacent objectives that can help with this problem. Hi. Um, I'm drawn to the first question you asked near the end about how do we build in this planning for preservation looking to the future. And I'm wondering whether you see any opportunities for the people who are these data scientists, these people filling these new roles, being sort of evangelists back to the creators and the capturers, and how can we help more people understand that this is something they should worry about now, because if they try to worry about it later, it'll be too late. Yeah, I mean, it's really telling, telling stories. And that part of the excitement at being at the, the beginning of building these kinds of systems for the web and the, the population of consumers we're building them for is that people don't already have expectations. Uh, they're pretty open to new ideas. And so there is a way to frame that. Um, it does involve aligning incentives very clearly. So you can't walk into a for-profit company and say, like, you need to spend hundreds of thousands of the dollars you barely have on storing things just because it'll be good. Because um, the most likely case there is, you know, it won't be good because they'll be out of business and no one will remember it anyway. Um, but there is definitely a way to build that mentality uh, into the product design process. And particularly when you're talking to people who live inside of active data systems, um, every product we use on the consumer web, if it's designed correctly, is looking implicitly at the data, um, at our behavior in order to optimize the design of the product. So if you can construct the problem as the data you collect will allow us to, will allow you to have a better business, a better product, while at the same time, um, perhaps allowing for something really interesting down the road. Like, that's how we'll win at this. Uh, and Bitly is a bit of an odd company in that, by its very nature, it was just this utility for shortening links and looking at clicks on links. There's no business there, right? So um, I joined very early on, almost four years ago, with a charter to sort of like find some value in the data. Um, and if there wasn't any, we could shut it down or do something else with it. Um, and we've managed to build a business that where Bitly itself is a machine where lots of data comes in, it gets aggregated out, and that piece goes to the people who pay for it, who are primarily the uh, enterprise sort of brands and celebrities who want to see aggregate analytics. Um, but we've managed to do that without uh, having to sell the data to people we didn't want to sell it to. Uh, and that's also a fairly novel thing. Group asks very hard questions. <laughs> Most of the time, it's like, why a pufferfish? <laughs> Have you ever done the analysis um, on your links to know which which things that these links were pointing to don't exist any longer on the live web? Yeah. So um, I've taken data as far back as 2009, uh, where. Um, off the top, I'll look it up and, and if you give me your card, I'll actually send you the results. But I took about 10,000 links per month um, for, every, I did this last year, so for every month from 2009 till last year, and looked at the percentage of sites that existed and no longer existed. 
keeping in mind that it is an extremely biased sample, because particularly in 2009 and 2010, the majority of Bitly data came through uh, Twitter and other social networks. Um, about 70% of those links were still alive. Um, that is not to say that they had the same content on them that they had at the time they were first encoded, but 70% were not for fours or other errors. of the internet, like you said earlier, looking at cats and uh, animated GIFs of people making funny faces, uh, do you think that our um, kind of zeitgeist as a generation will be partly pointless? Do you think that, that in, I, I, say, I say this as a, as a member of, of that generation that looks at cats, but uh, my, my question is, uh, do, do you think that it, it somewhat waters down our preservation of material of data if we're <laughs> preserving things that are important and things that we, we are surprised that became important. So I actually don't think so. And um, everyone who's joined my team sort of goes through this emotional cycle where at first you're just really excited because it's great data and it's really fun to play with. And then you hit a, you start actually looking at it and you realize how obsessed people are with Kardashians. And like, <laughs> Like, I thought a, a Kardashian was a Star Trek character before <laughs> this job. Um, and then you, you, realize, you go through this whole phase where you're like, oh my god, humanity is completely doomed because all people care about are celebrities, royal babies, and sports scores. Um, but eventually, you come out the other side of it and realize, at least for me, that um, it is the great theater of humanity, and it is absolutely beautiful. Um, and that it is in no way my place to be judgmental. I think human nature is consistent and that people have always gossiped and what we see in online communication is just gossip at scale. Um, and that's it, right? It's, uh, and that's fine. But there's a deeper question in what you're asking, which is when there's so little friction to communicate, um, when it used to take a lot of work to communicate, people perhaps were more thoughtful in the things they did communicate. And so, you know, have we lost that ability to say, this is important to me, world, um, here you go. And maybe we'll see a resurgence in handwritten thank you notes and, uh, and that kind of etiquette will evolve to catch up with the, the communications tools we have. But I don't actually think young people now are any more shallow than people were <laughs> years ago. That's actually a really good idea for an app. It would be a, like only important things and it's a lot of work to publish on it. Like maybe you have to solve some puzzles or something. <laughs> that would be a lot of fun to play with. So on a related note, um, I, so I felt for a while that, well, obviously this community's job and goal is the preservation of the cultural record in some ways. And those things are the cultural record right now, right? But this, not necessarily within this community, um, is anyone taking responsibility for the preservation of, you know, animated GIFs and internet cats, um, which I think is a shame. Um, but I think we have this problem uh, with the web where it's a little bit harder to say whose responsibility it is to kind of collect the aggregate like that, um, when, as you say, the value is in the aggregate. So. Um, as you see it, as you said, I mean, it's, it's striking that, you know, it's not the goal when you're building systems to, to think of them in terms of preservation. And those are the organizations that are enabling the publication of, of Internet Cats are building those systems. So they're not thinking about preservation. So who should be thinking about preservation of those, of those types of things? How should we think about that as a collective? Well, I'll nominate you. Um. <laughs> It's actually, it is a really interesting question. Um, like, do we want to leave to chance the idea that um, that this stuff will stick around? Probably not. So is it worth it to us as a community to say, um, you know, this cultural zeitgeist is important to us and we want to record it in some way? And then what is the right form to do that in? And um, I think there is, uh, 
at least an assumption of uh, that we have to be very completist about it, and I don't actually think that's nearly as important as it seems. Um, and I, I see that because of the data Bitly sees. So Bitly is 30%-ish of all links on Twitter and the same volume from Facebook, and that makes up about 20% of Bitly's total data. And then it's this whole long tail of uh, email is still, I believe, the biggest social network for sharing links, and it's Tumblr and Pinterest, and you know, even 3D worlds like Cabo Hotel, which is populated by Brazilian teenagers, and all sorts of weird places on the internet. Um, and so when, when I talk about the data set, I actually say, okay, imagine the Earth, and imagine the entire population of the Earth, and now take only 30% of that population, and you will still see all of the major cities protests, uh, highways, um, everything that is really significant will show up in that subset. So can we think about it that way, where we try and find um, not everything, but the things that were significantly important at the time. Um, and maybe that's an easier, maybe that's an easier or more approachable task. I think even a single person could do that given the technical tools we have available. I also look forward to the coffee table book of animated GIFs. <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe I'll ask the final question. Um, you mentioned the individual. Um, what? Mike, yes, okay. You mentioned the individual. Uh, one of the things that some of us wonder about is so-called personal archiving. Uh, at a consumer level, we're all creators of data, uh, some of which may have long-term value from a personal perspective, and perhaps even a smaller subset of larger cultural value. I wonder what your thoughts are on the feasibility of trying to figure that out, or trying to be able to make progress on that. Because right now, it's pretty much everybody's on the ground, and there's some very crude tools, but nothing really terribly robust. Yeah, um, this actually seems a lot like the quantified self movement, but for an orthogonal purpose. And for those people who haven't gotten into that corner of the internet, the quantified self movement is a bunch of people who are monitoring their health uh, to a incredibly obsessive degree. Um, and I think it's actually a hugely important movement for all of us because they are going to learn things that you know, those of us who would never be willing to log every single calorie we eat, every step we take, will be able to benefit from. Uh, and perhaps what we need then is a personal archiving movement that is similarly exploratory and investigative. And it's actually very easy because the data is all just sitting there, right? So you have all of your, if you're using a modern email system, you have all of your email. Um, you have access to all of your Twitter, Facebook communications, and probably the other networks. And even if you don't, we can write things that pull them out. And then run a proxy server that captures everything you see. And you have that data. So let's do it. <laughs> okay. All right. And thank you all very much, and especially to whoever lent me their dumbbell. <laughs>